This is Dr. Chanel Conception, and in this module we will be talking about qualitative research designs and approaches. This is part of our lecture series on nursing research. For the past weeks, we have been learning about quantitative research and had a little bit of snippet of qualitative research, but this time we dig a little bit deeper into qualitative research, and it is my hope that you will have a new appreciation of this method and its value in the nursing research and also nursing profession. In previous lessons, we have differentiated quantitative from qualitative research. And I think this is an illustration that depicts the contrast between quantitative methods and qualitative methods. As you can see, quantitative methods is concerned with numbers and making inferences or understanding the behavior or the phenomenon through um, statistics whereas qualitative methods you are digging deeper into just the not not just the numbers but looking at the what yeah, for example this person is asking what did you feel when you saw the free ice cream and also digging deeper into the why so you one of the stark contrast between quantitative and qualitative research is their approach to knowledge generation. Of course, the deductive approach is aimed at testing a theory, creating a hypothesis, and doing several observations to confirm or reject the hypothesis and to strengthen or have some recommendation about the theory. Whereas in the qualitative approach, it is more inductive in that it is concerned with the generation of new theory that is emerging from the data, from the observations, looking at patterns, and maybe later on you can, you can come up with a hypothesis or there would be an, a theory that would emerge from the data that you have collected. So we have discussed this in previous um, lessons, uh, the contrast between quantitative and qualitative research, but let's just refresh our uh, memory about the qualitative research approaches. We talked about how that this is inductive. The goal is the depth of the data and generating hypothesis or a theory. Not necessarily, not all qualitative research would generate a theory, but some like grounded theory do. The setting is natural. Sampling is not concerned with random, but purposive. Your data collection would be probably interviews, FGDs, observational tools, and your data analysis would be iterative for interpretation and content analysis. And of course, if you merge the two, that would be called a mixed method. To some researchers, including nursing scholars, sometimes there is a debate between who is more superior. Is it the quantitative approach or the qualitative approach? So the question, who reigns supreme? Well, that is sometimes difficult to answer. But if we are to look at this evidence-based hierarchy, we cannot escape the fact that, that the, the tradition of science remains to be uniquely quantitative. And the quantitative approach to research design has been justified by the success of measuring and analyzing, replicating, and applying knowledge gained from this paradigm. So it's demonstrated in this EVP pyramid, the paramount in the ranking uh, and the strength of evidence is the quantitative approach, like your RCT or your um, systematic review of RCTs. And if you can see, the, the qualitative research is down here, close to the bottom, single in-depth qualitative study. So you can see, maybe I would say a certain bias in terms of looking at EBP in a more um, uh, towards uh, quantitative researches. However, the Johannes Briggs Institute, this is an international research organization based in Australia that promotes and supports the use of evidence-based practice, especially in the nursing field, to inform the decisions at the point of care and different approaches to ranking evidences. They um, presented or proposed a different way of looking at evidences using their FAME, F-A-M-E framework. F is for feasibility. A is appropriateness, M is meaningfulness, E is effectiveness, and e, another E is economic evidence. 
And if you look at meaningfulness, and this is probably where the qualitative method um, would be more appreciated. So they have different levels of evidence in terms of meaningfulness. So you can see at the top here are qualitative or mixed methods systematic reviews. And then you have the qualitative or mixed methods synthesis. And then the single qual uh, qualitative study. And then a uh, different expert opinion um, down here at the bottom. So they really appreciate or they really um, recognize that in terms of meaningfulness, qualitative research has value. So I always wanted to look at this in, uh, an, in a more kind of a yin and yang fashion, that the quantitative and qualitative research do not need to be at war with each other, but they can complement and they can work in harmony to generate understanding of some of the problems and issues that we face in the nursing research um, profession. For example, um, I, there was one time that we were working with Georgetown University and USAID project about the, the standard ACE method. So they had collected really a lot of data for you know, clinical trials to see if it's effectiveness. But there was one question is, what is the experience of the women using this, this standard DACE method. So we cannot just look at it through the numbers. So what um, the USAID in Georgetown did was when I was in Dallas La University, we took on the qualitative part. We, uh, so we went to the women who used it and had focus group discussions so that we could have a deeper understanding of their experiences in using this method because Later on, they will be the end users of this um, contraceptive or uh, fertility control method. So this is just an example of how the quantitative and the qualitative researches could complement each other. Einstein said that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So even with such a very brilliant mind and very highly statistical approach probably that he uses in his science, he still recognized that some things cannot be counted and these are important things that matter in life and in science. Um, I really like to look at this quote by Cranster. He said, early philosophers argued that human phenomenon could not and should not be reduced to mathematical formulas. So this is why qualitative still has a place in research and in science. Thorne also said that the practice of qualitative research has expanded in clinical settings because empirical approaches have proven to be limited service in answering some of the challenging and pressing clinical questions, especially where human subjectivity and interpretation are involved and many of the phenomena in nursing that we deal with uh, as a human science are concerned with the, the humanist uh, aspect of a certain question issue or phenomenon so we cannot just limit the to, to quantitative researches alone so what do we really want as nurses we wanted to to grasp the lived experience of the patients, of the clients we care for. We want to enter into the world of our patients and our clients so that we can understand, we can have better understanding and empathy towards them. And we need to understand the basic social processes that illuminate human health and illness events. That's one of our aims. So these things cannot be answered just by um, quantitative uh, methodologies alone. So to understand the philosophical underpinning of qualitative research, we have to go back to Rene Descartes. Uh, Rene Descartes' view of science was long held as the only approach to new knowledge. And his ideas were grounded in objective reality. He believes that there is a reality out there and we have to understand it. But of course, you know, many of the realities in life and in nursing and in health sciences could not be explained by just understanding or explaining cause and effect. So came in Kant. He was questioning the fundamental nature of reality as seen through Rene Descartes' lens or the Cartesian lens. Kant proposed that perception was more than an act of observation. For him, his reality was not explained by cause and effect. And he raised the issue about supporting the notion that 
Nature is not independent of thought or reason. What was observed, therefore, was not the only reality. So he, uh, in a way, Kant was really um, kind of cultivating the soil for qualitative research. So uh, uh, gaining ground from Kant's um, thoughts, many of the scientists questioned whether empiricism or uh, positivism was the only way to gain knowledge. So to further Kant's proposition came the German scientist, Edmund Husserl and Heidegger, and they developed this idea of self, self-conscious reality, and freedom. So the movement of phenomenology um, started to, to arise from, from, this, um, from Kant's thinking. Later on, there's this American um, scientist called Thomas Kuhn, and he was the first one who really um, explained paradigm shift. And he was saying, he was kind of challenging the way we look at the science. He's looking at, as he said, there's anomalies in the way, um, a way of looking at a certain phenomenon. So he, he proposed that we need to have a paradigm shift, especially in a discipline, specific method of solving a puzzle or problems and viewing human experience as structuring reality. So there was a change in the world in the way of viewing a phenomenon in the world. So he, he also introduced that there's not just um, you know, the positivistic way of looking at things. We have to look at things in, in a more naturalistic, historicist perspective. So if you look at causality, we, we talked about how quantitative research um, is concerned mainly special experimental research between the cause and effect. So um, some people would say that you know causality and qualitative they don't map, they don't really belong to the same domain. Okay, so when you say causality, cause and effect, that is the domain of quantitative research. But there are also others that argue that causal explanation is a legitimate pursuit of qualitative research and it's well suited to understand causal relationship. And sometimes because of the deep explanation of certain phenomenon, we can have insights on the cause of why things happen the way they do. So depending on in-depth understanding of meaning, context, and process that qualitative researchers can provide. So this could be certain arguments, uh, but mainly qualitative research, uh, the goal is not really to prove a cause and effect of a phenomenon. So what is qualitative research? Of course, qualitative methods are often employed to answer the whys and hows of human behaviors, opinion, and experience. So let's go into looking deeply into qualitative research. Now, the purpose and focus of qualitative research, it's interested in understanding the meaning people have constructed and how people make sense of their world and the experiences that they have in the world. So here it's not concerned about um, what is causing A or B, the cause and effect, or the association of variables. This is really getting a deeper understanding of um, the being of people, the meaning that people have in their experiences. So what does it mean to think qualitatively? We are looking at the meaning of an experience, of a phenomenon, maybe of somebody who's going through a certain disease. And one of the things that I really like about qualitative research is it's giving voice to the people. It's allowing your participants, your respondents, to talk about their experience. And you're seeing through their eyes. And it's also giving yourself a voice because you cannot dissociate your, your, your feelings, your bias, your interpretation from the data that you're, collected, that, that you're collecting. And the assumption is, what do we do with it? And it's more holistic. You're not just looking at the numbers or one aspect of a phenomenon or a condition, but you're looking at it in, in a more holistic manner. You're engaging in the world of others. And as a researcher, you need to have that art of listening. So let's look into the qualitative research approaches and the um, each of the design and qualitative research, they, have diff ha they all have their uniqueness, but there are also common features that cut across um, qu 
qualitative research designs and sometimes even the boundaries within each of the research tradition could be blurred because they share some of this characteristic. But uh, some of the common features for qualitative research design is that the frameworks are not used the same as quantitative research, so it's pretty obvious. And of course, like we said, the goal is not testing a theory. And each study should be guided by a particular philosophical stance, of, of course, except for those just the generic uh, descriptive um, qualitative research. One of the things that is also common in um, qualitative research design is what you call emergent design. So it emerges in the, in the, as the field unfolds. It's not like when you make a qualitative research, you just say, okay, I'm going to make a phenomenology or I'm going to make an ethnography. Sometimes it starts with a question. And when you look at the question, you will have to be thinking about you know, um, what is the best uh, methodology that is suited for this? Maybe you start to plan one certain methodology and later you would say this is not the best way to answer the question. So it could change or the design could emerge as you go deeper into your data or looking at uh, or observing from the natural setting. So the qualitative design could be flexible. Um, this is also, even in the methodology and the steps of doing a qualitative research, um, there are suggestions for many authors in qualitative books, like you do this first, second, third, fourth. But sometimes, uh, like Mon Hall was saying, it's, it is not like step-by-step -step approach. It could be a step-wise because you could do step number one, number two, number three, and you think you need to go back to number one again because there is something in your data that suggests that you need to go back, a kind of iterative process. And then maybe you, could, you need to go to number four, five, and then go back to number two again. So this is what you call there's a flexibility or stepwise approach, especially in its procedure. Still, there is a need to plan for the broad contingencies that post decision opportunities for study design in the field. It doesn't mean that qualitative research say, okay, let's just see what happens here, and there's no planning. We need to still look at um, you know, some contingency measures and still do certain planning. So what are the things that we plan for? First is we need, we have to make sure that, um, before we do planning, we have to look at the characteristics of qualitative research design. So. Um, we have to be, like we said, it's flexible, okay? If there's some new information, then we need to be able to, to uh, adjust our, our design, our processes and procedures based on new information. Um, there's holistic understanding, okay, uh, as a whole. And sometimes there is a need to merge different data collection strategies. For example, you're doing an um, interview right now and you think that, you know, you need to do you know, um, maybe an, a focus group discussion, or you need to also do um, observation while you're doing um, focus group discussion. So sometimes there's different merges or, um, you know, uh, intermingling of data collection strategies or when you're doing a qualitative research. The researcher is the tool, and this is very important in qualitative research. You are the tool. So as a researcher, you get intensely involved. Um, if it's a big research, institutional research, for example, you may have, you know, um, research assistant, but as the main researcher, you need to be really immersed into the phenomenon that you are studying. And it's an ongoing analysis of data. When you move forward, you look at the data. You, you, it's not like in quantitative research where you collect the data and after you collect the data then you analyze it and that's it. But in qualitative research often you collect the data for example one or two interviews you analyze it and then you say how do I move forward and then you, you collect more data and analyze it again and then maybe you say do I have saturation or do I have enough information? Are there new informations that I'm gathering? So sometimes the data would dictate, especially in, in grounded theory, your data would dictate how you would move forward. So um, some of the common features is the philosophical stance. Okay, so when you say philo philosophical stance is it directs the question that are asked. It's always good to be able to um, identify what is your philosophical stance, just for, for example, which I will talk about more later on, because it directs the question that you're asking, okay? 
and then it also directs in how you will make your observation and how you would interpret your data. The philosophical stance, the philosophy that comes with a research method or the research tradition that you've chosen will always be at the back of your mind when you do when you, you know your research question, when you do your data collection, and when you analyze your data. What do we include when we plan for a qualitative research project? The first thing we need to do is to select a broad inquiry framework or tradition, because this will guide your decision about what to do next, how you would um, do your data collection, how you would frame your questions, <clears throat> and how you would analyze your data. For example, you have decided to do phenomenology, so you have to understand what is phenomenology? What kind of phenomenological approach do you want? Is it more descriptive, hermeneutic, interpretive? And this will guide you throughout your study. You also need to be able to know how much time do you have? Because you know, qualitative research is, could be an iterative process and it could take years on and on if you don't know when is the end point and when is the time you will say, okay, I have enough data to answer my research question. Do you have half a year, the whole year, or many years, and then there's no time limit for you to do this um, qualitative research? Some people say that, oh, I don't want to do qualitative research because it takes a long time. It really depends. You have to plan it well and uh, with the time constraints or the time limitations that you have in mind. The cost, that's something you have to, to think about. The constraints. You also need to think about your data collection strategy. Um, if you know your framework, you could have an idea what data collection method you would use, but you also need to know that maybe from the data that you've collected, you may need to have other um, data collection strategies that you need to employ. So for example, in triangulation, <clears throat> after you uh, collect your data and after you analyze them, you would um, say, okay, I need to have another different strategies to um, confirm my data or um, to validate my data. You also need to look at collecting relevant materials, maps, organizational charts if that's needed. Um, you also need to probably look at what equipment do you have, recorder, video recorder, and other things that you need for your data collection. And you have to have what you call reflexivity, identifying personal biases views and supposition vis-a-vis -vis your phenomenon. Uh, in phenomenology later on, in descriptive phenomenology, we'll talk about bracketing. But even though it's not descriptive phenomenology, it's really important to really sit down and say, okay, what do I know about this topic or this phenomenon that I'm going to study? I'm going to write it down. Sometimes we keep a journal and we'll say, I just write it down so that I will have, I will acknowledge what I know, what are my biases, what are my points of view. Um, in approaching this research. So this is just a graphical um, illustration of what you need to do when you plan a qualitative research. We talked about um, understanding what is your research approach, knowing your philosophical stance, um, understanding your background, your beliefs, your biases. You have to write it down. You have to acknowledge it. Looking at the broad uh, data collection um, strategy, how would you do your sampling, and how you will approach your data analysis. So um, let's go to different qualitative research design. We don't probably have time to go through all of these, but I will uh, just look at phenomenology, ethnography, grounded theory, and have a very short discussion about the other um, qualitative designs like case study, descriptive qualitative narrative inquiry, and action research. So if you look at qualitative research, um, I talked about philosophical stance or research tradition. This is something that we need to understand. And although um, nursing does not really have, cannot claim to have its own research tradition, but we borrow <clears throat> different research tradition from different disciplines. For example, in anthropology. In the discipline of anthropology, their dom domain is culture. And the research tradition that they use as, is ethnography or ethnoscience and here they're looking at the holistic um, view of, of cultures right um, mapping the cognitive world of cultures and the culture uh, shared meanings so um, Leininger was actually trained as an, uh, an anthropologist so when uh, when she came back to nursing she said 
we need to have ethno nursing so that you know we can have our own research tradition in nursing but it's still based on anthropology or ethnography now in the psychology and philosophy field uh, the domain is the lived experience so these are the research designs phenomenology hermeneutic phenomenology and phenomenography this is another research approach so the area of inquiry you're looking at the lived experience of individuals looking at the life worlds we will discuss that later on interpretations and meanings of individuals experiences differences in the ways in which people experience or think about a phenomenon okay so this uh, this has roots in psychology and philosophy in psychology you have uh, the domain is behavior we have ethology uh, echo ecological psychology we don't really use this much in nursing in sociology we, we do a lot of this uh, social settings and interactions there's a lot of uh, nursing research that is bound in grounded theory and also the other uh, research designs for ethnomethodology and semiotics here you're looking at social structures the manner in which um, shared agreements is achieved and the social setting manner by which people make sense of social interactions this one is more domain social linguistics is more domain of um, human communication and um, there are some nursing research that are also borrowing from the history tradition they're looking at past behaviors events and condition this is historical research and the area of domain is description and interpretation of historical events so this is just to give us an understanding of the uh, re the research tradition based on certain disciplines and nursing has adapted to many of these disciplines okay let's go to the specific um, re qualitative research design and let's start with a very famous phenomenology okay so what do phenomenologists believe phenomenologists believe that human experience is meaningful and interesting so you need to be in the world being in the world or embodiment is a concept that acknowledges people's physical ties to their world so they are concerned with how people think how people see uh, their their experiences um, what they hear how they feel and they, how how uh, they are conscious of their body's interaction with the world around them so the questions that phenomenologic researchers ask is what is the essence and this is important the essence of the phenomenon as experienced by these people and they are also concerned with the meaning what does it mean okay and assume that there is what you call an essence the essence is it's an essential invariant structure that can be understood phenomenology is actually see can be seen in two as two things it's a philosophy and is and, and it's also a methodology it started as a philosophy we talked about Husserl and Heidegger you know um, having this philosophy uh, streaming from Kant's um, question of reality and how we view reality but later on it has evolved into a phenomenology um, that a lot of researchers use so phenomenology is a science whose purpose is to describe particular phenomenon or the appearance of things as lived okay so um, let's I'll show you a video um, about phenomenology to help us understand what phenomenology is welcome to an explainer on phenomenology at its most basic, phenomenology is the study of lived experience. As its name suggests, phenomenology is concerned with the study of phenomena that arise from the experience of being in the world. The development of modern phenomenology, established by Edmund Husserl in the early 20th century, was a break from the Cartesian system that pitched stark distinctions between the outer, real reality and the individual experience of reality. Following the Cartesian principle, outer reality is a separate and distinct entity that can only be understood in rational terms through cognitive processes of deduction. Sense perception was thought to distort this process and certainly emotions were considered a lower form of experience emanating from the recesses of the body. In contrast, phenomenology seeks to understand the outside world as it is interpreted by and through human consciousness. 
Ontologically speaking, that means speaking in terms of how philosophers understand the nature of being and existence, Hugh Searle purported that reality could be grasped by and through structures of consciousness by applying what he called intentionality to the object of study or intentionally directing one's focus to describe realities. For Hugh Searle, to achieve deeper understanding of an object of study, a researcher could quarantine their personal judgments, a process called bracketing, so that preconceived notions do not interfere with the phenomenological inquiry. It is at this point that Martin Heidegger's approach breaks with Hugh Searle's process. In fact, Heidegger was very critical of Hugh Searle's phenomenology where Hugh Searle sought to capture objects of study as graspable entities that could be objectively studied. Heidegger employed the notion of design, the situated meaning of a human in the world. For Heidegger, consciousness is a product or construction of the historical context from which it arises. And in turn, one can never approach an object of study in a pre-suppositionless form, that is, Objects of study cannot be neatly separated from their contexts, nor should they be. Reality and consciousness are co-creations, and because of this, human understanding always arises from the relationship between the two acting upon each other. Thank you for watching. Okay, so you have seen that there are two main um, authors or thinkers in the phenomenological um, uh, movement, uh, Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger. So um, Husserl 
was looking at, he is the intellectual founder of phenomenological philosophy. And if you really look at his background, he, he was a physicist. He studied astronomy and also mathematics. And he was a student of Franz Bren, Brentano. So um, he, he believes in descriptive philosophy, the essences of pure experiences. A first methodological principle is not only knowledge derived from immediate experiential evidence can be accepted. So his philosophy is if you want to get data, it's not really looking at the research, but you can derive the knowledge from the person who experienced the phenomenon. So some, some books say that Heidegger was a student of Husserl, but actually they were never really you know, uh, like a student teacher relationship, but they were in the same university and they were kind of, there's some uh, informal mentorship. And um, Husserl, Husserl was looking at Heidegger to be the kind of um, successor in his um, descriptive phenomenology. But you can see in, in that video, we, we, we have seen that um, there, there were differences in their opinion about phenomenology. So um, Heidegger is the most significant and gifted philosopher of the uh, 20th century. And this, uh, he was a German and studied theology. And later he turned into philosophy, mathematics, and also physics. So the focus, he said, is not in the knowledge of the phenomenon, but the meaning of their being. So he wrote the book, uh, Being and Time. And he is concerned with phenomenology in terms of the being in this world and the concept of time. So phenomenology means to let that which shows itself to be seen from itself in the very way in which it shows itself from itself. It's very difficult to, to understand, but this is a philosophical stance that uh, Martin Heidegger believes in. So um, they talk about design, the human way of being in the world, and it's derived from Husserl's phenomenology, modified, critiqued, and hermeneutic and interpretive in nature. So later on, after this German um, phenomenological movement, the French phenomenologists emerged. And these are Paul Sartre, Sartre existential phenomenology, Maurice uh, Merleau-Ponty as embodiment phenomenology, Hans George Gadamer um, went into hermeneutic phenomenology, Paul Ricou critical phenomenology. So the French um, kind of embodied and had a different derivative, especially from, from Martin Heidegger's um, phenomenological um, tradition. So if you look at phenomenology, if you read a lot of phenomenological works, there's different uh, variations. But if you look at, the, it started with a German. We have to understand that the Germans, Husserl and Heidegger, were the first one who um, who started this, this movement. And then the French, like we said, uh, uh, started to emerge, like Sartre, Marleau, Ponte, Gadamer, Ricou, and um, many of their works is influenced by uh, Heidegger. Okay, and then there's the um, the Dutch and some of the North Americans also created their kind of a variant of um, phenomenology. So there's Georgie, Kalaisi, Van Kam. They are more aligned with Husserl's descriptive phenomenology. And then the Utrecht, um, Van Manen, and then the American, uh, the, the, the nurse, Monhall and Banner are nurses who subscribe more to hermeneutic phenomenology or Heidegger's um, tradition of phenomenology. So let's look at uh, one of the types of phenomenology, which is descriptive. And one of the distinguishing factor of a descriptive phenomenology is bracketing. So bracketing is the process of identifying and holding in abeyance preconceived beliefs and um, opinions about the phenomenon under study. So this is what um, Husserl really thinks about, that there should be bracketing so that it will not be a bias or it will not contaminate the phenomenon that you are you are studying. So bracketing helps to remove influences that can block access to the meaning of a phenomenon. But this is where Heidegger and Husserl collide because Heidegger does not believe that there is bracketing. Okay, so for descriptive phenomenology, these are the four steps you need to do uh, bracketing. So this is this can be done through reflective journaling. You write in the journal and write all your biases, your preconceived ideas. It doesn't mean you have to eliminate them, but you just have to recognize them, put them somewhere in your reflexive journal. And then there's intuiting, being open to the meaning. So when you're collecting the data, you need to have an open mind. And then 
analyzing. So when you have all the transcripts, you uh, extract the, the themes, and then you cluster them until you come to the meaning or to uh, kind of the description of the phenomenon. And then there is the describing, describing the phenomenon based on the themes and clusters that you have identified. So Kalaisi is very uh, popular in terms of descriptive phenomenology, and um, this is very common in Husserlian, uh, phenom uh, in, in, um, Husserlian phenomenology using the Kalaisi method. So when you collect the data, you need to transcribe the data, and from the transcript you identify significant statements. So because let's like, say you have pages and pages of, of data there, but you only extract the significant statements. So from the significant statements, you will try to see what are the formulated meanings, aggregation of the formulated meanings. And then you categorize, cluster to themes, and then try to collapse them. So it's integrating all the result ideas. And then after you have clustered all the themes, you have to have an exhaustive description of the phenomenon. So this is reduction of the exhaustive description. And then you will come up with um, the fundamental structure of the phenomenon. And then you need to have member check. You return to the participants to validate uh, the description that is fundamental in the structure of the phenomenon that you are studying. So essentially, this is the Kalaisi method. So uh, the interpretive phenomenology or hermeneutic phenomenology is uh, aligned with Heidegger's philosophy. Okay. The question here is, what is being? He stressed interpreting and understanding, not describing human experience. For Heidegger, when you are describing something, you are actually interpreting. You cannot dissociate interpretation and understanding in your description. Okay. So lived experience is inherently an interpretive process. So uh, you can see a lot of um, discussion about hermeneutic circle when it comes to um, hermeneutic or interpretive phenomenology. So one understands the whole of a text, for example, a transcribed interview in terms of its parts and the parts in terms of the whole. So the researcher enters into a dialogue with the text and continually questions its meaning. So some, this could be just a... Um, uh, kind of illustration of what the hermeneutic circle is all about. For example, you have your transcribed text from the interview. So you look at it as a whole, you type to contextualize, look at the experience, look at the parts, integrate it again, look at the experience. So it's kind of going back and forth. It's an iterative process until you will really understand and get into the meaning of the phenomenon that you're studying. So the Utrecht School of Phenomenology um, one of the famous um, founders here is uh, Max van Manen, and I use Max van Manen in my dissertation. So uh, he said that hermeneutic phenomenology tries to be attentive to both terms of its methodology. It is descriptive because it's phenomenological methodology because it wants to be attentive to how things appear. It wants to let things speak for themselves. So it is also interpretive or hermeneutic methodology because it claims that there is no such thing as an uninterpreted phenomenon. So Van Manen uh, subscribes to what we call the life worlds. He, originally, there are only four life worlds, but he added another dimension, which is materiality. So corporeality is the lived body. What Van Manen thinks about is when there's an experience, these five dimensions can explain what the experience is all about. So it's about your body, your lived body. For example, let's talk, talk about a cancer. All right. So cancer, we'll talk about the pain that you go through, the physical pain you go through. That's corporeality. Another dimension is lived relations or relationality. When you have cancer, how do you relate with your family member? How do you relate to your friends and, and the people that take care of you? There is a relational dimension there. Temporality is about time. Time is not just the sequence or how long something takes, but what is your view of time when you have the disease, for example? You know about your mortality, for example. So you look at time in a 
a different way, in a different dimension. You experience it in a different dimension. Spatiality is lived space. So when you are, for example, in, when you're taking your infusion, your chemotherapy, what does the room feel like? That's spatiality. And materiality are your attachment to things. For example, when you're going through chemotherapy, you need to have your special blanket with you because it adds meaning to your experience. So this is how uh, Van Manen and even Monhal um, uh, subscribes to the life worlds when you're talking about the experience of a person. So I'm just uh, this is just the, a sample of um, my uh, dissertation and I was using Van Manen's hermeneutic phenomenology and I was looking at being cared for by Chinese nurses in Beijing the lived experience of non-Chinese patients. This is an example of a hermeneutic phenomenological research. So the other branch of um, Hermeneutic phenomenology is interpretive phenomenological analysis, IPA. You can see this in, in many books and in many research articles. The focus is the subjective experience of person, their life worlds. And there are three key principles to that. It investigates the phenomenon of experience, which is similar to other phenomenological um, researches. It requires intense interpretation and engagement with the data obtained from the person and examines it in detail. Now, ethnography, let's look at ethnography. So ethnography is the domain of anthropology. It provides a framework for studying meanings, patterns, experiences defined by a cultural group. So here the focus is the, the culture of a group. And the assumption is that every human group evolves culture that requires members to view the world and the way they structure their experiences. It doesn't mean you have to, to study indigenous peoples only. You could study a subculture or an organizational culture, institutional culture. So the aim here is to learn from rather than study the members of a cultural group. And these two terms are very, very important when you look at um, ethnography, emic and etic. So emic is the insider's view, the way the members of the culture envision the world. The etic is kind of the outsider's view, interpretation of the experience of that culture. But as researchers strive to get into a cultural experience that members do not talk about or may not even be consciously aware of. But if you're an ethnographer, you uh, try to um, get into the emic perspective. You want to be an insider, a participant in their culture, so you will understand um, their experiences and their culture. So field work is very important in, in ethnography, how the ethnography comes to understand the culture, um, the ethnographic text, uh, how the culture is communicated and portrayed. Um, Madeleine Leininger, one of the theorists, uh, created an ethnonursing. He, he, she was um, uh, what he called the schooled in the eth ethnographic uh, or uh, anthropologic uh, field. And he said, she said that the study analysis of local indigenous peoples' viewpoints, beliefs, and practices about nursing care behavior and process of a decimated culture and created this what you call transcultural nursing movement. But what uh, my, Madeline Leininger wanted is to marry care and culture, okay, and using uh, a, a unique methodology called ethnursing to look at culture care. Um, this is uh, my PhD student, Dr. Kirill Joy Rio, um, I, and I guided her in her ethno-nursing studies. She looked at um, the culture, care, beliefs, and practices of the Ayangans in Aguinaldo, which is in Ifugao, and she looked at the pregnancy and childbirth experiences. And you can see that she really spent a lot of time. She was a, she was a nurse, a community health nurse before, and she came back to study and do this ethno-nursing. So you can see here um, how she looked at the different positions um, in giving birth, uh, standing, pole, and all of these uh, from that culture. And uh, these are just examples of uh, what she, she got from, from that ethno nursing study. Other types of ethnography, there's institutional ethnography and a video reflexive ethnography. And this, this, here's an example of a video ethnography here and also ethnography. Let's, let's try to look at this one. Um, and it is uh, in a healthcare setting, which is uh, kind of interesting.
At the Care Management Institute, we're all about making care as good as it can possibly be for Kaiser Permanente's members. We found that to succeed in that work, we absolutely need to hitch ourselves to our patients and their experience and their voices to help guide us in the work we need to do. Unfortunately, we can't always have all our patients in the room with us while we plan and execute that improvement work. What we found we can do, though, is use a set of tools that we call video ethnography to learn from our patients' experience by going out, observing them, interviewing them, capturing their patient experience in video, then distilling it down into a set of key messages that summarize and motivate our teams in understanding what we need to accomplish to make that system the one we want it to be. Ethnography is a form of social science that's been around for a really long time. Anthropologists, sociologists have been doing ethnography where you interview people, you observe people in their natural setting and try and understand their experience, their culture, what really matters to them and make sense of all of that. What we're doing at Kaiser Permanente is we're coupling that ethnographic work, that social science, with video as a way to really understand our member needs and use that insight and understanding to drive quality improvement and, and to get breakthrough performance in the organization. We go to the bedside and we ask them questions that no one normally asks them. What can we do differently? What can we do better? What matters to you? This is about us the leadership of Kaiser Permanente, the Care Management Institute, really wanting to understand what your experience is, whether you're a patient, you're a physician, or you're a nurse, and how we can do the right thing. They've taken the time to step back and say, you know, let's listen to them. You know, how do I, um, uh, what is it that I'm doing is working? What is it that I'm doing is not working?
Okay, it's a really interesting way to do ethnography. Now, grounded theory. Grounded theory, it's an inductive research technique developed for health-related topics, and it was authored or started by Glaser and Strauss. And then it emerged from the discipline of sociology. So grounded means the theory developed from the research is grounded or it has roots in the data from which it is derived. So it doesn't mean that you, you uh, are going to test a theory, but your theory is from the data, is grounded, is based on the data that you collected in your research study. So I don't have to go through this, but the philosophical underpinnings of grounded theory are from the Strauss post-positive view, Glacier's positive view, and from Glacier, Glacier Charmaz was a student of Glacier. So it assumes that relativism of multiple social realities recognize mutual creation of knowledge by the viewer and the viewed. So if you look at the different versions of um, grounded theory, Glacier theory should emerge by constant comparison. And this is a very important um, concept in grounded theory. It should not be forced, but it should emerge. For Strauss and Corbin, Corbin was a nurse, they looked at it as a pres prescriptive de and developed category. For Charmaz, it's more constructive grounded theory. Um, categories and theory co-constructed by the researcher and respondent or is more constructivist, attends to language and action, examines how experience is constructed and structures are erected. And many of the nursing research adopt this, mostly these three um, versions of grounded theory. So one of the things that is very important in grounded theory is constant comparison. So it's used to develop and refine theoretical re th theoretically relevant categories. So you look at data collection, note taking, coding, memoing, and then compare it with another set of data. Okay, so um, it goes goes on. You can constantly compare one data set to another. So you can see here there is no ground and no theory in grounded theory, but you can see that it, it is inductive process, there's positivism, it goes back, there's constant comparison until you're able to look at the constructs that could be used for a uh, constructing a theory. So decision making during, uh, this is just an example of a grounded theory, decision making during trial of labor after cesarean, a qualitative study with gynecologists. So, um, usually you can you will notice that grounded theory is looking at processes social processes and many uh, like for example Charmaz says you have to use gerund gerund are like um, words ending in ing right the uh, decision making or uh, more on action so they're looking at certain processes that's one of the st distinguishing factor of grounded theory narrative analysis or narrative inquiry one of my students um, got used this in his dissertation and it focuses on storytelling he was talking about grit okay grit among nurses as an object of inquiry to examine how individuals make sense of the events in their life so the narrative analysts explore form as well as cont content and asking why was the story told that way okay so this is um the the framework that um, my student dr richard um, sullivan uh, made in his narrative inquiry, the voices of great experiences of nurses working long term in Philippine hospitals. This is just an example of a narrative inquiry in nursing. Case study is also a different um, design. It's an in-depth investigation of a single entity. It could be one person or it could be a small number of entities or it could be a group, but it has a singular um, concern, which could be individual, family, or institution, or a situation in a social context. This is an example of a case study research. Um, it's not distinctly a methodology. Uh, this is a tip. And many ethnographies focus on specific case, as do many historical case studies. So it could be incorporated in, for example, different kinds of methodology. So other qualitative um, designs is a descriptive qualitative study it does not have a particular discipline or methodological roots it's still very valuable for example some of the some of the programs uh, wanted to just have a, a qualitative understanding about a certain phenomenon or concern so they don't they're they're not so concerned about the research tradition but they just wanted to look at content analysis thematic analysis and more in-depth understanding of a concern or an issue 
So these are some of the research, I don't have to go through this, but these are some of the researches that have ideological perspective, like the action research, okay? So this is learning and action, co-researchers, not the research subject, research with explicit purpose of creating change. The emphasis is on the emotional as well as the analytical logic, iterative, again, like just any uh, qualitative research, and there's a real-time um, knowledge generated. Um, you might be, you might hear this very often, participatory action research, like your COPAR in your community nursing. It assumes that the participation in research by those affected by it democratizes research and therefore has a transformative potential. So the PAR is specifically focused on the concerns and issues, especially of the oppressed. So this is just an example of a PAR project to learn about how best to support family carers in home-based end-of-life care. So the project involved the development of a training program to enhance the knowledge and skills of volunteers and support workers who coordinate care with a bereaved family. And for usually participatory action research involves the people in the community in the research process. Um, this is not a, a, a separate um, a qualitative research design, but this could be incorporated in many of um, the research design like phenomenology or ethnography, which is the photo voice. And you're using pictures to depict, you know, the experiences of people. So th this could be used, this could be a step or incorporated or aligned or mixed together with other qualitative research methodologies. This is just an example of a student, my, my PhD student, who um, looked at the lived experience of loneliness, understanding the older Filipino men's lived experience through photo voice. So um, she gave them a chance to take a picture of something that depicts their, their loneliness as, as widows. So that was our discussion about qualitative research design. And before we end this lecture, there's just some things that I want to um, share. We enrich others and ourselves by exploring qualitative research, and that's one of the beauty of using qualitative research. Do not do not do research for the sake of doing research. And you pursue research topic that advance the nursing profession. No matter what the research design is, if it's qualitative or quantitative, um, our goal is always to advance the nursing profession. Thank you very much.